Jackson, 1767 to 1845. Personal Politics. It is very seldom that a man arises from an obscure and humble position to an exalted preeminence without peculiar fitness for the work on which his fame rests, and which probably no one else could have done so well. He may not be learned or cultured, he may even be unlettered and rough. He may be stained by vulgar defects and vices which are fatal to all dignity of character, but there must be something about him which calls out the respect and admiration of those with whom he is surrounded, so as to give him a start, and open a way for success in the business or enterprise where his genius lies. Such a man was Andrew Jackson, whether as a youth or as a man pursuing his career of village lawyer in the backwoods of a frontier settlement, he was about the last person of whom one would predict that he should arise to a great position and unbounded national popularity. His birth was plebeian and obscure. His father, of Scotch-Irish descent, lived in a miserable hamlet in North Carolina, near the South Carolina line, without owning a single acre of land, one of the poorest of the poor whites. The boy, Andrew, born shortly after his father's death in 1767, was reared in poverty and almost without education, learning at school only to read, write, and cipher. Nor did he have any marked desire for knowledge and never could spell correctly. At the age of thirteen he was driven from his native village by its devastation at the hands of the English soldiers during the Revolutionary War. His mother, a worthy and most self-reliant woman, was an ardent patriot and all her boys, Hugh, Robert, and Andrew, enlisted in the local home guard. The elder two died, Hugh of exposure and Robert of prison smallpox, while Andrew, who had also been captured and sick of the disease, survived this early training in the scenes of war for further usefulness. The mother made her way on foot to Charleston, South Carolina, to nurse the sick patriots in the prison ships, and there died of the prison fever in 1781. The physical endurance and force of character of this mother constituted evidently the chief legacy that Andrew inherited, and it served him well through a long and arduous life. At fifteen the boy was a homeless orphan, a sick and sorrowful orphan, working for a saddler in Charleston a few hours of the day as his health would permit. With returning strength he got possession of a horse, but his army associates had led him into evil ways and he became indebted to his landlord for board. This he managed to pay only by staking his horse in a game of dice against two hundred dollars, which he fortunately won, and this squared him with the world and enabled him to start afresh on a better way. Poor and obscure as he was, and imperfectly educated, he aspired to be a lawyer, and at eighteen years of age he became a law student in the office of Mr. Spruce Mackay in Salisbury, North Carolina. Two years later, in 1787, he was admitted to the bar. Not making much headway in Salisbury, he wandered to that part of the state which is now Tennessee, then an almost unbroken wilderness, exposed to Indian massacres and depredations, and finally he located himself at Nashville, where there was a small settlement, chiefly of adventurers, who led lives of license and idleness. It seems that Jackson, who was appointed district attorney, had a considerable practice in his profession of a rough sort in that frontier region where the slightest legal knowledge was sufficient for success. He was in no sense a student, like Jefferson and Madison in the early part of their careers in Virginia as village lawyers, although he was engaged in as many cases, and had perhaps as large an income as they. But what was he doing all this while, when he was not in his log office, and in the log courtroom sixteen feet square? Was he pondering the principles or precedents of law, and storing his mind with the knowledge gained from books? Not at all. He was attending horse races and cock fightings and all the sports which marked the southern people one hundred years ago, and his associates were not the most cultivated and wealthy of them either, but ignorant, rough, drinking, swearing, gambling, fighting rowdies, whose society was repulsive to people of taste, intelligence, and virtue. The young lawyer became a favorite with these men and with their wives and sisters and daughters. He could ride a horse better than any of his neighbors. He entered into their quarrels with zeal and devotion. He was bold, rash, and adventurous, ever ready to hunt a hostile Indian, or fight a duel, or defend an innocent man who had suffered injury and injustice. He showed himself capable of the warmest and most devoted friendship as well as the bitterest and most unrelenting hatred. He was quick to join a dangerous enterprise, and ever showing ability to lead it. 
the first on the spot to put out a fire the first to expose himself in a common danger commanding respect for his honesty sincerity and integrity exciting fear from his fierce wrath when insulted a man terribly in earnest always as courteous and chivalric to women as he was hard and savage to treacherous men above all he was now a man of commanding stature graceful manners dignified deportment and a naturally distinguished air so that he was looked up to by men and admired by women what did those violent quarrelsome adventurous settlers on the western confines of american civilization care whether their favorite was learned or ignorant so long as he was manifestly superior to them in their chosen pursuits and pleasures was capable of leading them in any enterprise and sympathized with them in all their ideas and prejudices a born democrat as well as a born leader his claim upon them however was not without its worthy elements he was perfectly fearless in enforcing the law laughing at intimidation he often had to ride hundreds of miles to professional duties on circuit through forests infested by indians and towns cowed by ruffians and he and his rifle were held in great respect he was renowned as the foremost indian fighter in that country and as a prosecuting attorney whom no danger and no temptation could swerve from his duty he was feared trusted and boundlessly popular the people therefore rallied about this man when in seventeen ninety seven a convention was called for framing a state constitution jackson was one of their influential delegates and in december of that year he was sent to congress as their most popular representative of course he was totally unfitted for legislative business in which he never could have made any mark on his return in seventeen ninety seven a vacancy occurring in the united states senate he was elected senator on the strength of his popularity as representative but he remained only a year at philadelphia finding his calling dull and probably conscious that he had no fitness for legislation while the opportunity for professional and pecuniary success in tennessee was very apparent to him next we read of his being made chief justice of the superior court of tennessee with no more fitness for administering the law than he had for making it or interest in it mr parton tells an anecdote of jackson at this time which whether true or not illustrates his character as well as the rude conditions amid which he made himself felt he was holding court in a little village in tennessee when a great hulking fellow armed with a pistol and a bowie knife paraded before the little courthouse and cursed judge jury and all assembled jackson ordered the sheriff to arrest him but that functionary failed to do it either alone or with a posse whereupon jackson caused the sheriff to summon him as posse adjourned the court for ten minutes walked out and told the fellow to yield or be shot in telling why he surrendered to one man when he had defied a crowd the ruffian afterwards said when he came up i looked him in the eye and i saw shoot there wasn't shoot in nary other eye in the crowd i said to myself it is about time to sing small and so i did it was by such bold fearless conduct that jackson won admiration not by his law of which he knew but little and never could have learned much the law moreover was uncongenial to this man of action and he resigned his judgeship and went for a short time into business trading land selling horses groceries and dry goods when he was appointed major general of militia this was just what he wanted he had now found his place and was equal to it his habits enterprises dangers and bloody encounters all alike fitted him for it henceforth his duty and his pleasure ran together in the same line his personal peculiarities had made him popular this popularity had made him prominent and secured to him offices for which he had no talent seeing which he dropped them but when a situation was offered for which he was fitted he soon gained distinction and his true career began it was as an indian fighter that he laid the foundation of his fame his popularity with rough people was succeeded by a series of heroic actions which brought him before the eyes of the nation there was no sham in these victories he fairly earned his laurels and they so wrought on the imagination of the people that he quickly became famous but before his military exploits brought him a national reputation he had become notorious in his neighborhood as a duelist he was always ready to fight when he deemed himself insulted his numerous duels were very severely commented on when he became a candidate for the presidency especially in new england but dueling was a peculiar southern institution most southern people settled their difficulties with pistols some of jackson's duels were desperate and ferocious he was the best shot in tennessee and it is said could lodge two successive balls in the same hole as early as seventeen ninety five he fought with a fellow lawyer by the name of avery in eighteen o six he killed in a duel charles dickinson who had spoken disparagingly of his wife whom he had lately married a divorced woman but to whom he was tenderly attached as long as she lived 
Still later he fought with Thomas H. Benton, and received a wound from which he never fully recovered. Such was the life of Jackson until he was forty-five years of age, that of a violent, passionate, arbitrary man, beloved as a friend and feared as an enemy. It was the Creek War and the war with England which developed his extraordinary energies. When the War of 1812 broke out, he was Major General of Tennessee Militia, and at once offered his services to the government, which were eagerly accepted, and he was authorized to raise a body of volunteers in Tennessee, and to report with them at New Orleans. He found no difficulty in collecting about 1,600 men, and in January 1813 took them down the Cumberland, the Ohio, and the Mississippi to Natchez, in such flat bottom boats as he could collect, another body of mounted men crossed the country five hundred miles to the rendezvous and went into camp at natchez february fifteenth eighteen thirteen the southern department was under the command of general james wilkinson with headquarters at new orleans a disagreeable and contentious man who did not like jackson through his influence the tennessee detachment after two months delay in natchez was ordered by the authorities at washington to be dismissed without pay five hundred miles from home jackson promptly decided not to obey the command but to keep his forces together provide at his own expense for their food and transportation and take them back to tennessee in good order he accomplished this putting sick men on his own three horses and himself marching on foot with the men who enthusiastic over his elastic toughness dubbed him old hickory a title of affection that is familiar to this day the government afterwards reimbursed him for his outlay in this matter, but his generosity, self-denial, energy, and masterly force added immensely to his popularity. Jackson's disobedience of orders attracted but little attention at Washington, in that time of greater events, while his own patriotism and fighting zeal were not abated by his failure to get at the enemy, and very soon his desires were to be granted. In 1811, before the war with England was declared, a general confederation of Indians had been made under the influence of the celebrated Tecumseh, a chief of the Shawanok tribe. He was a man of magnificent figure, stately and noble as a Greek warrior, and withal eloquent. With his twin brother, the prophet, Tecumseh traveled from the Great Lakes in the north to the Gulf of Mexico, inducing tribe after tribe to unite against the rapacious and advancing whites. But he did not accomplish much until the war with England broke out in 1812, when he saw a possibility of realizing his grand idea, and by the summer of 1813 he had the Creek Nation, including a number of tribes, organized for war. How far he was aided by English intrigues is not fully known, but he doubtless received encouragement from English agents. From the British and the Spaniards, the Indians received arms and ammunition. The first attack of these Indians was on August 13, 1813, at Fort Mims in Alabama, where there were nearly 200 American troops, and where 500 people were collected for safety. The Indians, chiefly Creeks, were led by Red Eagle, who utterly annihilated the defenders of the fort under Major Beasley, and scalped the women and children. When reports of this unexpected and atrocious massacre reached Tennessee, the whole population was aroused to vengeance, and General Jackson, his arm still in a sling from his duel with Benton, set out to punish the savage foes but he was impeded by lack of provisions and quarrels among his subordinates and general insubordination. In surmounting his difficulties, he showed extraordinary tact and energy. His measures were most vigorous. He did not hesitate to shoot, whether legally or illegally, those who were insubordinate, thus restoring military discipline, the first and last necessity in war. Soldiers soon learned to appreciate the worth of such decision and follow such a leader with determination almost equal to his own jackson's troops did splendid marching and fighting so rapid and relentless were his movements against the enemy that the campaign lasted but seven months and the indians were nearly all killed or dispersed i need not enumerate his engagements which were regarded as brilliant his early dangers and adventures and his acquaintance with indian warfare ever since he could handle a rifle now stood him in good stead on the 21st of April, 1814, the militia under his command returned home victorious, and Jackson, for his heroism and ability, was made a major general in the regular army, he then being 47 years of age. It was in this war that we first hear of the famous frontiersman Davy Crockett and of Sam Houston, afterwards so unique a figure in the war for Texan independence. In this war, too, General Harrison gained his success at Tippecanoe, which was never forgotten but his military genius was far inferior to that of Jackson. It is probable that had Jackson been sent to the north by the Secretary of War, he would have driven the British troops out of Canada. There is no question about his military ability, although his reputation was sullied by high-handed and arbitrary measures. 
what he saw fit to do he did without scruples or regard to consequences in war everything is tested by success and in view of that if sufficiently brilliant everything else is forgotten the successful and rapid conquest of the creeks opened the way for jackson's southern campaign against the english as major general he was sent to conclude a treaty with the indians which he soon arranged and was then put in command of the southern division of the army with headquarters at mobile the english made the neutral spanish territory of florida a basis of operations along the shores of the gulf of mexico thus putting in peril both mobile and new orleans they virtually possessed pensacola the spanish force being too feeble to hold it and made it the rendezvous of their fleets the spanish authorities made a show indeed of friendship with the united states but the english flag floated over the forts of the city and the governor was in sympathy with england such was the state of affairs when jackson arrived at mobile at the head of parts of three regiments of regulars with a thousand miles of coast to defend and without a fort adequately armed or garrisoned he applied to the secretary of war for permission to take pensacola but the government hesitated to attack a friendly power without further knowledge of their unfriendly acts and the delayed response ordering caution and waiting did not reach him thrown upon his own resources asking for orders and getting none he was obliged to act without instructions in face of vastly superior forces and for this he can scarcely be blamed since his situation demanded vigorous and rapid measures before they could be endorsed by the secretary of war pensacola at the end of a beautiful bay ten miles from the sea with a fine harbor was defended by fort barrancas six miles from the town before it lay eight english men of war at anchor the source of military supplies for the fort on which floated the flags of both england and spain the fleet was in command of captain lord percy whose flagship was the hermes while colonel nichols commanded the troops this latter boastful and imprudent officer was foolish enough to issue a proclamation to the inhabitants of louisiana and kentucky to take up arms against their country a body of indians were also drilled in the service of the british so far as indians can be drilled to regular warfare and soon as the true intentions of the english were known to general jackson who had made up his mind to take possession of pensacola he wrote to the spanish governor a pompous inefficient old grandee and demanded the surrender of certain hostile creek chieftains who had taken refuge in the town the demand was haughtily rejected jackson waited until three thousand tennessee militia for whom he had urgently sent arrived at mobile under the command of general coffee one of his efficient coadjutors in the creek war and colonel butler and then promptly and successfully stormed pensacola driving out the british who blew up fort barrancas and escaped to their ships after which he retired to mobile to defend that important town against the british forces who threatened an attack the city of mobile could be defended by fortifications on mobile point thirty miles distant at the mouth of the bay since opposite it was a narrow channel through which alone vessels of any considerable size could enter the bay at this point was fort bowyer in a state of dilapidation mounting but a few pieces of cannon into this fort jackson at once threw a garrison of one hundred and sixty regular infantry under major lawrence a most gallant officer these troops were of course unacquainted with the use of artillery but they put the fort in the best condition they could and on the twelfth of september the enemy appeared the fleet under captain percy and a body of marines and indians under colonel nichols jackson then at mobile apprised of the appearance of the british hastily reinforced the fort about to be attacked by a large force confident of success on the fifteenth of september the attack began the english battered down the ramparts of the fortifications and anchored their ships within gunshot of the fort but so gallant was the defense that the ships were disabled and the enemy retreated with a loss of about one hundred men this victory saved mobile and more it gave confidence to the small army on whom the defense of the coast of the gulf of mexico depended end of section one